Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. This is Carol Laurie, naturopath, acupuncturist, homeopath, and your integrative breast cancer expert. And I am really honored to be here today with Ann Fonfa, the head and CEO of the Annie Appleseed Project. And she has an going to share with us her story, which is really an example of how you can live taking the best of both worlds. And she is also going to share with us information about her upcoming conference, which I was a speaker at in 2019. And um, it's in February in Florida. And I have to say that if you are interested in learning about really what is integrative medicine in the world of oncology, this is the conference you want to go to. So welcome, Anna. Thank you for spending some time with all of us here. My pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate so it. I think there are a lot of people who don't really know who you are and your story. And I really would appreciate it if you would just share a little bit what you're comfortable with, with the audience. Okay. No problem. Uh, I was diagnosed with uh, invasive breast cancer lobular in uh, January of 1993. So now I'm a 30-year survivor. That was a and long time ago. A and long time the world ago. has changed enormously for breast cancer treatment since then, right? So the thing for me is I was dealing with extreme multiple chemical sensitivity. Everything set me off. Any kind of smell, and I smelled everything. I called myself a dog. Smelled everything. People's fragrance, deodorant, shampoo, cleaning products, diesel, you know, everything bothered me. And I would be in bed for two or three days a week. So that was very serious. And for people who've had breast cancer, it doesn't necessarily hurt. So, I, you know, it was not a major thing for me and unexpected because I was a vegetarian. But I later discovered through my, my knowledge base expanding, I wasn't a healthy vegetarian. You know, I was eating fruits and vegetables, which I adore. But I traveled for business and I was going to Wendy's with my team in any city that I traveled to. And so because I was a vegetarian, I said, okay, hold the hamburger and I'll have everything else. So I'd be having the white bread bun and, you know, the iceberg lettuce and the special sauce and the pickle. Right, the special sauce filled with God only knows what, right? Right. So, you know, but I had not a lot of options. In fact, people may not realize this, but in the 70s and 80s, you could go in a restaurant and say, uh, you know, wait, I see you have asparagus with your lamb. Could you just put asparagus on the plate? Hold the lamb. And I see you have chicken with broccoli. Could I have the broccoli on my plate? And they'd be like, well, what are you going to eat? It was another world in the 70s. Yeah, and was, the word yeah. detox wasn't even a household world, word. I mean, we've come so far. And those of us who have been in that uh, industry, in that life, uh, we remember. But, you know, it it wasn't like it is now. No. So now I'm diagnosed with breast cancer and I didn't know anything at all. It was pre-internet. I didn't know anybody with cancer. Everyone I knew had died. And people, you know, this is weird, but people went out of their way to say, oh, my next door neighbors, oh, but she died. Oh, my coworkers, oh, but she died. Like, really? So I was diagnosed. Not helpful. <laughs> no, I was diagnosed by a male doctor and I generally prefer women, but I didn't know that I could choose my own surgeon. That's, I knew nothing, never been in the hospital, never had anything. So uh, his in his office, the nurse comes in and says, oh, we have an opening Monday. Your insurance company approved it. Now, I thought you get a second opinion because your insurance company won't give you what you need. So I was, oh, this is a relief. I'll have this. But I also heard of the worst cancer in the world because it's only four days until the surgery. Because, you know, the general thought was it took a long time to get surgery scheduled. Again, I knew nothing. So on uh, Friday, I went to work. On Saturday, my husband and I lay in bed together and I assured him everything would be fine, even though I thought I was going to die any minute. <laughs> and on Sunday at 8 p.m., I get a phone call and this woman says to me, you don't know me, but I'm a 10 year breast cancer survivor. Honestly, 30 years ago, I still get goosebumps because she saved my life, knowing, knowing that, that I could was survive. the universe taking care of you. Yeah. Changed everything. I mean, so I went into surgery cheerful because I'll be fine. However, my surgery was scheduled for 10 a.m., but I didn't get surgery until 2 p.m. I was in the hallway wearing one of those gowns, no shoes, no glasses. You know, I didn't know where I was. I mean, it was spacey. It was also freezing. Nobody offered me a blanket or anything. And I just sat there for, you know, laid whatever I was doing on the table outside in the hallway for hours, four hours. And my husband Horrible. didn't know what was going on. 
and I'm gone for four hours. So he's having, he's a nervous guy to begin with, unfortunately. He's the worrier in the family. <laughs> but the surgery was fine, you know. And then uh, I wake up from the anesthesia and I hear a nurse's voice, a woman's voice saying, you had a lumpectomy and now you're fine. So that was good. And I echoed that for myself for years. You know, now you're fine. Now you're fine. And, and that was all helpful. You know, I didn't recognize the mind-body concept at the time, but that's what it was between the woman who told me I could survive 10 years and this voice was great. However, the doc came in and he says, oh, they're all negative. And I said, no, I, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, no, your lymph nodes. We took 18 lymph nodes in the left arm and they're all negative. So back in 1993, in January, there was no um, sentinel node although I particularly wrote down on my list of what's completely bad. Why are you taking sentinel? You know, so I said to him, why did you take the lymph nodes? And he says, oh, we're going to try and choose which chemo we're giving you. Because back then there were two different right. And you needed 18 to do that? I mean, I just have to say, even now I have women who have had that many lymph nodes removed. And for those of you who are listening now and those of you who are watching the replay, you need to take charge of how many lymph nodes you're going to give them permission to remove. That is critical because you're the person who has to live with the side effects. And as Anne is going to share with us in the future of having 18 lymph nodes removed, and it's no longer a necessary or medically indicated procedure. So absolutely correct. Please, please listen to this and absolutely don't be worried correct. about them thinking you're difficult. You want to be a difficult person, not even a patient in their mm -hmm. eyes, because you need to be in charge of what happens to your body. I agree. And I, you know, he, when we were talking originally, he said to me at the end of it, do you have any questions? In my naivete, I could not imagine that he hadn't told me what I needed to know. And it just never occurred to me. And I didn't want, I didn't want to say, oh, doc, am I going to live? Because that seemed corny and unrealistic. So when, when the time came and he tells me this and I say, well, that's really weird because I don't think I can do chemo. I have this chemical sensitivity. Well, everyone thought that was complete nonsense. Oh, don't it wasn't worry, a that diagnosable was illness to begin with. But the other thing that happened was I was awake for six nights after the surgery. So I was stuck at the hospital for two days. My husband had the intelligence to say to the doctor on day two or even on the evening of day one, can my wife come home? You know, does she need to be in the hospital? And so they said, oh, no, no. So we'll, they, they let me out the second day, but uh, the third morning. But I had two nights in the hospital. I, I roamed the hospital with the pole. I had the IV two nights in a row. Not one human being spoke to me. No nurse, no doctor, no staff, no porter, no sweeper, nobody. They didn't. It was like I didn't exist. And that's how I felt, completely fogged up, no sleep. And I went home and I had four more nights with no sleep. So as you know, and I'm sure the listeners can imagine, it, it's crazy making. Well, you're sleep. psychotic at that point. Yeah. So first thing that happened is I got up in the night to urinate and I slammed my pinky toe on the right side because I was protecting the left side and I broke it, you know, but there's no treatment for a broken toe. So I tape it up. But, you know, it was a real drag on top of everything else. And then shortly thereafter, I discovered I had lymphedema in my left arm. Again, I go to the doc and I say, look, my arm, my chest is swollen. My arm is swollen. What's going on? A week later, my hand was swollen. I went down to do my floor exercises and I see this big bubble in my left hand. I'm like, oh, what's going on? And I go back to the doctor and I say, doc, look. And he says, oh, yeah, your hand is swollen. It doesn't tell me you have lymphedema. So three months later, no treatment. I find out what it is because I was reading an article from a women's cancer group in California. And they said, this is, you know, and I was like, oh, no. And there was no internet. Then. No I mean, we just need to take a moment and realize what Anne was going through because now you just go on Google and you go swollen hand after breast cancer surgery and, you know, 15 things pop up. Right. No internet. How were you to learn about this? So in reading this newsletter, I was on the train meeting my sister in Washington, D.C. We were going to the 1993 March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights. And you know, I read this, that I have another forever lifetime disease. And I was really upset and I was crying. As soon as I saw her, I started crying. I throw myself in her arms and she's very upset because she, like my husband, worrying, oh no, Annie never cries. What's going on? So I said, I have another disease. I can't believe, you know, anyway, the good news is for those who have lymphedema, there is a treatment called MLD, manual lymphatic drainage. There's and a I'm, lot. And it can be helped. And I went to an osteopath who was able to remove it from my hand two years after it had happened, and it never came back. I mean, it's not perfect. People who know lymphedema can look at my thumb and say, well, you probably have it in your thumb, but not like I had it. I couldn't use my left hand before. Luckily, I'm right-hand dominant. But, you know, there's there's things here. 
And so I also joined a support group. Most useful thing I ever did. Lots of people think support groups are cry fest, but they are not. They are helpful. There was a woman who was got breast cancer during pregnancy, so I discovered you could get it during pregnancy. There was a woman whose father had breast cancer, and she was told, oh, that doesn't matter that your father had it. And I said, wait, I had 10th grade biology, and that said you're half your dad and half your mom, and when they meet, that's who you are. And how could it not matter? So that was another thing. The third thing was this young woman. She was, a, I think, a psychotherapist in the hospital. She didn't tell anybody because she felt that she would be disrespected in her work. So that was sad because not telling people. In those bad. days, it was, yeah. uh, there's a Yiddish word, a shanda. It's a shameful thing. And I just need to take a moment to talk about this because before President, then President Ford's wife, Betty Ford, came out with breast cancer. She had, she came out that she had it. There was, it was a secret. It was a shameful disease. You didn't want to tell anybody. And the treatment for it was brutal. So we need to thank her. And many years later, there's no embarrassment about breast cancer or shame. And there was a lot in the 60s, 70s, and even in the 80s. She was very brave. I, I saw a movie about her life. It was very brave, very strong thing to do. So this young woman says to the group, um, I told my doctor not to cut the brachial nerve. And I say, what does that mean? What's and that? Says, so, you know, you have that numb spot on your upper arm, which never goes away, by the way, 30 years out, still numb. <laughs> and she says, I told them not to cut it. So then I go to my surgeon and I say, doc, why'd you cut the nerve? And he says, well, it might have developed scar tissue around it. We might have had to cut it. So then I said to him, I didn't know that I was going to walk away, but I did. And I said to him, I never want you to do anything to me just in case. I want every step to be because I need it. It's OK. Now I go to an oncologist because that's what you do. And, you know, so I went to the oncologist knowing that chemo was just not in my world. And by the way, in addition to my own issue, my uncle had lung cancer, nets to the brain, lungs cleared up, but he had the brain tumor. And I, he was in a hospital in New York. And I'm for some reason in charge for no reason. It was before I was diagnosed. I didn't know anything. But I'm the family go to. I'm the oldest on every side of the family in the, of that my generation. Okay, so his doctor said to me, you know, if your uncle doesn't have a chemo and radiation, he's going to die in three months. And I was like, oh, oh no. So we give him chemo and radiation, and he dies three weeks later. And I yeah, radiation to the, the brain is extremely... Um, happened? Well, in those days, they didn't even have targeted. They give you a whole no. brain, period. So, And he died three weeks later. So I say to the doctors, there were two of them, what happened? And they say, well, we didn't promise anything. So... Here I am going to the oncologist knowing they don't promise anything, which, by the way, brings up an important thing, which is ask them what they expect the outcome to be of any treatment that you were offered. What is the expected outcome for you? Very, very important because we hear we're going to cure you with this treatment. It's going to be great. And they're saying we're going to treat you with this. It's not the same thing. You have to be aware. You have to ask questions. It's your right to do that. So now you need to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. You need to ask a lot of questions. And yes. if the doctor is not willing to sit with you and ask that, answer them, you need to find another doctor. That's not. You can bring a friend. You can make notes. You can tape record. You're allowed by law to do these things. So it's your right to know. Again, I know anything. So I go to the oncologist. And as I walk in, he says, oh, we'll, treat, we'll start chemo next week. And I said, you know, oh, doctor, really? I have a, a problem. And he says, it doesn't matter. And I say, wait, could I just tell you, I'm passing out. I fall in, into bed three days a week with a terrible headache. I have rashes. I'm allergic. I can't go anywhere. I can't stand print. I don't no longer read. And I'm a readaholic, you know. So he says, oh, doesn't matter. Same voice. You'll be fine. Yeah. So I said, okay, it doesn't matter to you, but yeah, it sure matters to me. It's my life. So I say goodbye and I leave and I never go back because how can I? He didn't see me, which was another of my demands. I want it to be about me. It's not. It's not, I'm not the cancer patient in room seven. I'm Ann Fonfo with my own personal needs. You're not and so is everyone else. You're not the cancer patient. That's the first thing I think that women <laughs> need to realize. They're not a cancer patient. You're a person. I don't try really, don't even use the word patient. I don't like it. I think it's diminutive, dismissive. I agree. You're a person who has a diagnosis. You have a chronic disease and it happens to be breast cancer or whatever your cancer is. Yes. So I'm in the support group and all the women are upset because I'm not doing anything. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. There was no information. And I said to them, oh, I'm sure there's an alternative. 
And I said, oh, wait, it was like a bell rang. And I said, well, I've heard of that, alternative medicine. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to find out because I have to do alternatives. I can't do chemo. Now, my husband says, you've got to look into radiation. You can't ignore that just because politically you think radioactive waste is bad and you're an anti-nuclear person, which I was. I am still. So I go to um, uh, the hospital in New York. It's in the basement, which is creepy to begin with. I get on the scale, first thing. The scale, I weigh 18 pounds less than I think I should. Now, the one thing I knew about cancer was you lose weight and you die. So I was like, oh, I'm dying already. It's only a, couple, a month, two months. Yeah. So the nurse comes in and she says, oh, that scale's always off. I say, you know, you could correct it. And then people wouldn't have a heart attack while they're, anyway, that was one. Second thing, I have lymphedema and my left arm is over my head because they put in plastic care, cast and it's supposed to be here. So my hand falls behind my head and it hurts because it's swollen. Yeah. And I said to the guy, well, you know, I have to move my hand because it, it's hurting and it's in the wrong spot. And he says, I'll ask the doctor. Well, he never does that. Now the plastic cast is going on this angle, right? So that's not great. And it hurts. Number three, I'm in the room getting measured for where they would do the field. And the field is my entire upper left side, the entire quadrant. And like what's on grass. your left? Wait, what's what? Yeah, is what is on my left? left? Exactly. It's called so, your heart. Right, my heart. My left lung and my heart were in the field. And the woman says, who's measuring, says, I wish the doctor would stay in the room. I'm only a student. I'm not sure what I'm doing. So, you know. Okay, that was the third strike, but I had another one. I go to talk to the doc and she tells me, well, we have the new machine or the old machine. I said, okay, I'll have the new machine. She says, no, nope, it's whatever machine's available. So then I say, look, everything was wrong in this procedure. How can I possibly, how could, how? So then my husband and I drive to Boston because we thought we, that's where we used to go for a casual vacation from New York City. We drive to Boston, there's a snowstorm coming behind us, but we're talking, talking, talking. We get to Boston, we sit down with a friend, we're having dinner. And uh, everyone says to me, you have to do what the doctor says. And I said, yeah, I really can't. My heart. I come from a family. All I know is that everybody in my family had heart disease in prior generations, including now or since my sister and my brother. My brother died of heart disease two years ago. So, I mean, he was younger. All right. It was not good. So and, and my lung. And so I started there was by a miracle. Someone told me about the library. Um, I forget what it's called, but it was in the Judson Memorial Church basement. And it was all about medical stuff. It was something like Center for Medical Consumers, but I, I may not be. And, and a woman run it, ran it who I got friendly with. And I went in there and I found studies about what happens later on. So it was known already in the 1990s that radiation to the heart, to that area, to the chest in general, can cause harms, vascular harms too, to your blood system. So I didn't do radiation. I didn't do chemo. So now... <laughs> You know, I'm trying to find things and I find a lot of things and I start doing them. And I don't know if any of them will work, but time goes by. In 18 months, I have recurrence, but I don't have a panic because, you know, I think I can handle this and I go on handling it in a variety of ways. I have a friend who's an acupuncturist. Absolutely. I discovered that uh, she, I mean, I, I just, when she became an acupuncturist, I said to her, I want to be your first customer. Did I know anything about acupuncture? Zip, nothing. I mean, where could I find that out, you know? Acupuncture has so, been treating cancer. Acupuncture in Chinese medicine, I'm, which I am also, I know, has been treating oncology for thousands of years. Thousands of before years before radiation and chemotherapy. Right, but nobody told me. But my friend told me. So she's. I, I start going to her, and in three months, my menstrual cramps stop. I right. mean, I couldn't believe it. I didn't have the worst of the worst, but it was no fun. Gone. Never came back. I, I was unbelievable. So of course, I went into natural menopause because I didn't have chemo. And so I was learning all these things and incorporating them into my own protocol, changing my diet to be, uh, uh, you know, all organic and to be as much. No more Wendy's. Vegetables. Right. Nothing like that. I brought my own food everywhere I went, including I when I traveled. Do. Then I started going to conferences and learning things and asking questions. The very first one I went to, my friend was with me. She's science oriented. And she goes up and talks to the researcher up front at the, at the podium after that talk. I stand up and say, wait, I have a question. And she's pulling my arm down. She's pulling me down. Don't ask anything. Don't ask anything. I don't care. I'm not that type this of person. This was the so. beginning of Anne becoming an advocate. This was her first advocate <laughs> moment, which she has 
exemplified for thousands of women over how many years, 15, 20 years? I mean, you are an example and you've saved hundreds and thousands of lives by your advocacy. You know, I, I can't claim anything except, you know, the few who let me know. But overall, yes, I know it's been helpful. I understand that it's wonderful. It's the meaning of my life. Mm -hmm. But I learned, I spoke up. I couldn't let things happen. Uh, you know, doctor says patient failed the treatment. And I say, doc, nobody me, failed the, the treatment, treatment failed didn't work for the woman. Yeah. I mean, you know, no person fails treatment. That's impossible. And, you know, it, it just goes on and on. There's a million things. So I went to FDA meetings and an FDA meeting, I heard them say the drug was well tolerated. So I said, wait, did oh. you take it? Did you take that drug? Oh, no, <laughs> they don't do that. I said, I don't think it was well tolerated. That's my opinion. We'll find out. Of course, we found that over time. Definitely not. There are so many harms. And I focused on that for, for one big part of my advocacy is don't do any harms. You're not supposed to, but you're doing it. And you're saying, well, cancer, but that's not okay because if those people are going to survive, that's questionable. But if they're going to survive, they shouldn't be tormented. They shouldn't be disfigured. They shouldn't be messed up. So that was a big area. And then the other thing that I thought was incredible, they said no unexpected toxicities. Again, I say, really? okay, Unex if they're unexpected, Unex unexpected. They where knew. Do for them, how do you know? How can you possibly know if you didn't expect them? Where are they? You know, but they don't understand. And I'm I'm doing this over and over and over at every meeting I go to. And eventually, oh, sorry, Ann, that microphone's not working. Oh, sorry, Ann, we're out of questions. Honestly, happened quite a while. Then eventually, so then I said to the pharmaceutical industry people at the meetings, because they always exhibit there and they're there in force. And I used to run the division of a business. So I know how business is. It's about your division has to be the best in the company. That's all you care about. So that's all these people care about, mostly men, but not solely now. It's better. And anyway, it was mostly men. Yeah, right. It, it was. It used to be. Not so bad. So I say, you know, you go to an FDA meeting, everybody there except the advocates know what the topic is because the people who work in the industry, they talk to each other, you know, they talk to each other. So you get to submit your comments two weeks before the announcement of what it's actually about. All you have is the name of the drug. Very little information, especially prior to the internet. So I complained to the FDA about that. You know, how can you be an advocate? It's not on equal ground because they're not getting, I mean, you name it, I've complained about it because it's wrong, it's wrong. Okay, so now I go to pharma and I say, look, I have a great idea. What if in a clinical trial, we let people, we tell people, here's some exercise you could do. And maybe if you eat fruits and vegetables during this, you know, and here's a way to relax. And they said to me, oh, we can't patent that. And I say, well, what, 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 who cares? You know, what's that? But all they care about, and I mean this sincerely, making money. Yes, there are wonderful people who work for these companies, wonderful people, but they don't make the decisions. Decisions are made in the back room and they're made on a business level, which is what's bringing us the most money possible, period. There's no other thing and no other consideration. And I mean that. So when they make a drug, so the other thing is for years and years and years and years and still, a new drug comes out and what's the advantage? Two to three months. Anybody who looks up a drug can see this, two to three months. So I said, how come all drugs are falling into the two to three month category? Aren't there drugs that like home runs, so to speak? No. So when there are, like for example, the drugs that cure hepatitis C, they cost a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. So, okay, you know, so these are all things that matter to me. And I, I decided in 2007, a, a, a man came to me and he said, look, I'm a ph philanthropist. I want you to do a conference. I want you to invite a particular doctor who's actually speaking this year, Keith Block from Illinois. Oh, I love and, Keith. Yeah. Keith and is I said, um, the, the CEO of his center in Chicago. He's very, very, very well known in the world of integrative oncology. And he has been a pioneer for many years. Yeah. To, brilliant guy. So I said, okay, we could do that, but it's a lot of work. And, you know, we're a volunteer operation. Nobody gets paid in my organization and we don't pay our speakers. As you know, we don't pay our speakers. So, I mean, they do get free entry. <laughs> got to be good about that. But. Okay. I, I was honored to come. I think it's an honor to be invited and an honor Thank to you. come. And it's really grassroots bringing information to the people who need it the most. Yeah. So that first year I discovered insomnia, never had it before. <laughs> I was a great sleeper, but you know, I began to like, how's this going to come together? Because here, this guy and I make a deal. He died suddenly of a heart attack. So oh, no. yeah, it was, I mean, I felt terrible on every possible level for him, for his family and for my 
my my conference what's going to happen so mutual friends went to the family who ran the foundation now and said look you know maybe you could follow through with his promise so they did oh how nice yeah it was great and we had I mean, one thing I decided right up front, we're having all organic food at every meeting. I know. You're showing food. people. Yeah, we're the only conference in the world that has all organic food. And it costs a lot of money, which is why we it have does. an entry fee. Because you got to pay for what you get. But yeah. it, it was very, very important for me to show people in your two and a half days, or in the old days, it was two days, but now it's two and a half days. You are detoxing in real life. You are getting the benefit, you know, because people used to say to me, oh, I'm going to the bathroom like crazy. That's you're supposed to. That's healthy. That's People don't realize about. that you're supposed to go to the bathroom more than one time a day. I mean, the, I mean, constipation is an, the number one problem of health in America, and most Americans are constipated and don't even know it. So, yes. Well, of course, I agree, Carol. And the interesting thing is that was one of my problems. I was constipated for, off and on for 40 years. Yeah. I, when my friend became an acupuncturist, I was 41 years old, and she started helping me. And honestly, this is probably TMI, but I started having little tiny what I call mouse plops. Yeah. On a daily basis. But because it was every day, I was thrilled. Now, I've been to doctors. My mother took me when I was 15, 14. Doc says, oh, it, it's normal for you. Twice yeah, a week. They don't. Okay. In those days, they Twice didn't Twice a know. week, he said. Right. It's fine, he said. And then the, uh, the next doctor I went to said, oh, it's your nerves, you know, because women and nerves and hysteria and all that. Insulting. Nerves. So I said, you know, I'm really a kind of a calm person. I don't think it's my nerves. But I didn't have a solution, you know, and life went on. But now on AnnieAppleseedProject.org, our website, we have a handout on what to do about constipation. Simple things, simple things. And they all could be combined. And it's not about taking Metamucil, ladies. Please no. do not take Metamucil. I mean, it drives me crazy. It's like eating cardboard in your no, intestines. It sucks up all of the liquid and it makes things worse. Any of that over-counter stuff, citrulline, whatever they tell you to take, you please do not take that. You're wasting your money and it's you're harming your body. Totally agree. And, you know, I <laughs> often say the sad thing about pharmaceutical, it's like a sledgehammer. You really needed a tap and that's a problem. So our constipation handout, the one thing I would say to everybody, well, two things. One is elevate your feet when you're sitting on the throne, because if your knees get higher, it's easier to let go. Second thing is there's a massage. I'm sure, Carol, you know about it because I was taught by acupuncture. You start in your Although um, Dr. Wang, my Chinese herbalist, swears it doesn't matter. But you start in your lower right, go up under the rib cage and down the left side. You do it as many times as you want. Yeah, I, I circled it. But it, it works good. And you can feel the spots. I mean, I know exactly where my harms, where my <laughs> blocks were, so to speak. Yeah. And I could work them out. And now, you know, it's it's pretty good. I mean, years of effort. But Drinking it's water. worth it. Lots, lots of water. And I just also, brought my water near me yeah, for that black reason. Black seeds are in my smoothie. Right. That's a proprietary formula that I give all the people I work with. I That's mean, great. there's so many natural things. But, and let's get on to how your, you know, you started small. And then when was your first conference? 20, not, 2008. 2008. So here we are. The end of January. Here. Yeah. Well, now this is our 15th <laughs> conference. And, uh, of course, we didn't have any in 21 or 22. But in 2012, we had two. So now we're up to our 15th. It's in a very nice hotel. They're very cooperative. The food, lots of local farms and restaurants donate food for a conference. Lots of companies donate their products. We have a giveaway bag. It doesn't have nonsense in it. It has useful information and things that will be helpful. I mean, if it has anything about uh, natural cosmetics, they're completely natural. They don't harm anything. If it's uh, skincare, it's clean as could be, and so on. Some, you know, sample dietary supplements. And our exhibitors also, there's dietary supplements, there's hands-on treatments, there's <clears throat> various methods for detox. There's there's just a lot of really, and you can see on our website right now what some of the exhibitors are. Uh, we we have um, Friday night movie. <laughs> the movie is going to be this Friday about medical use of cannabis because that's a very, very important issue these days. And we, oh, thank you. And we like people to know that um, if you can't remember the whole thing, just go to AnnieAppleseedProject.org. There's a wonderful little button that you push to go to conference, but that's the correct URL. So Friday night movie, the only thing, the only meal that's not included in the package is Friday dinner. But the a hotel will use our organic food Friday night in their restaurant for anyone who wants an organic meal. Like me, I'm a 100% purist. Me too. And uh, I really love my organic food. Although I, I can't say 100%. I love Indian food. I've yet to, my dream, my dream is for an organic Indian restaurant. There are some 
organic Indian foods that you can buy in a supermarket, you know, a health supermarket. And I do that from time to time. But my dream is that my next door neighbor is an Indian chef and I provide the organic vegetables and she cooks them for me. But, that you know, should that's, be doable. That shouldn't be a dream. That should become reality. Hi. Should be. <laughs> should be. I'm not a cook, obviously. I once made a curry, but it took a while. Not my thing. <laughs> so if there's more than one step, you know, forget it. I don't do it. I, it's funny because in junior high school, I was all home economics. I think this is my career, but it didn't work out that way. No, but I found you my have, calling. You have obviously. put your focus and energy and you can't always do everything. I think no. you have to prioritize what you want to put your focus into. So another thing I want to tell the audience, so, so the conference, we have yoga Friday morning and Saturday morning and taught by, you know, just amazing groups of people, various people. We have Qigong. We have a wonderful local guy, Dr. George Love, who is a Qigong master and he gets everybody up and at it. I'm, I'm probably the only person who can't follow it. It's just too, it's like you know dancing. I can't follow matter. dancing either. You just stand there and you yeah, move your yeah. hands and your arms. You're getting the benefit. It doesn't I agree. have to be perfect. And he's, he's on um, Instagram and you can, it's slower on Instagram. So I'm able to do that. I've incorporated some of the moves into my morning regimen. I, you know, I had lost my discipline for a while and I was not exercising enough. So I, I slowly went back and, and this is the thing. You know, sometimes they say, oh, you have to do 30 minutes of vigorous physical exercise. And I say, wait, start with what you can do. Five how about, minutes. Yeah. How about you take a walk? Mm -hmm. Anyone can walk. If you can't go outside, walk around your house. If you can't get out of bed, get your arms up here and then wiggle your ankles. You know, that will get the lymphs flowing as much as you can if you're stuck. The first thing, we have a health postcard. It's called Three Steps for Health. The first step is one more fruit and one more vegetable a day. Can you do that? I think so. You know, we're not saying change your whole life today. I mean, maybe you could, and that wouldn't be terrible. But I did it in process. I, I became a vegetarian slowly. I became a vegan well, quicker because I needed to. But, you know, exercising. So I started out with five minutes, just as Carol said, Dr. Carol. And then, you know, now I'm up to 25. It's great. And I feel great. And in the afternoon, I walk outside. I live in South Florida, so I can pretty much walk outside all the time. And I get sun, which is very important, vitamin D, and I supplement vitamin D too. And I walk around, I mean, vitamin D3 also. Yeah, you know what you meant. <laughs> I want to be clear. And I, you know, and I again started that, you know, just a, a little back and forth, but now I'm up to 25 minutes there. So I can see the changes in my body. The muscle tone is developing really, really well. And I know that anyone can do it. I'm not special. I'm just lucky, you know. So here's another thing. It's not luck, I, Anne. It's not luck. It's determination and focus. And it's going slowly and really believing in your soul and your heart that self-care is achievable and you deserve it. It's it's not about luck. It's about really yeah, going you're right. slow. You're right. And, and I, you know, I... <laughs> I have a lot of, I, I wanted to tell this interesting news. So 30 years ago on January 11th, I had breast surgery. Four years ago on January 11th, I was diagnosed with follicular lymphoma. So follicular lymphoma is the one that's advertised as if you were working with Roundout, Roundup, it's a chemical. Well, so I said I was chemically sensitive and that was the outcome many years later that I developed follicular lymphoma. So it was shocking, but you know, I understood. Okay. So I had, um, again, I don't do chemo. So I'm, I met a female doctor, my choice, because now I know how to do that. And we had this big discussion. I'd like to try a half dose of a monoclonal antibody. And she says, okay. So I come in for the first treatment. She's on vacation. I'm sure a lot of people have had this happen. And this male doctor comes charging out with three nurses. And I'm sitting in the chair. And they're surrounding me. And he's leaning over me and he says, we can't give you that regimen. It'll kill you. You're going to die if you don't do it right. So I said, you know what, sir? I'm going to have to go home because I'm going to die. I prefer to die at home. And I left because I can't take anything like that. Why should he have the right to tell me I'm going to die if I don't do That's the you regimen? You don't talk to people like that ever. Right. It was it was bad. It was and bad. this was now. This was in yes. 2022. This yes. was not it, in 1985. years ago. Yep. Two or three years ago. So I get home two hours later, I get a call from the nurse from my doctor and she says, we're going to do the one you planned on. We're, so, but I didn't know that they also give you um, steroids. I and give Benadryl. steroids all the time. Yeah. And Benadryl and uh, the little white pills for headaches. Zofran. Oh. 
well, no, it was Tylenol, Tylenol. So I had never even had a Tylenol in my life. Wasn't ready for it, but uh, she wasn't there. So I, I had the regimen. But when I saw her, I said, do I have to have steroids? Because, you know, I like my brain the way it is. And even though I take fish oil, which offsets some of the problems, and I do acupuncture weekly, I, I don't want steroids. So she says, I said, can you cut it in half? And she says, yeah, we don't even need it. We don't even need it. Why are we giving it to me? Okay. So a week later, then, uh, well, actually, my treatment at the time was, you know, steady for a while and then every two months. So next time I saw her, I said, I don't want the Benadryl because, you know, I did get some rashes as a result of the treatment. Which is a normal have, side effect. Right. I have aloe vera plant on my lawn. I cut the leaf. I squished it all over the rash. It was fine. So I said, I don't need the Benadryl because I am also drinking Dr. Wong's herbs, which I'll discuss in a minute. So now I have no Benadryl. I have no steroids. And, uh, and then I said to her, really don't want Tylenol because Tylenol, you know, liver problems and I don't need it. I don't, I'm not, I'm not having a headache. I have my herbs. Okay. So now I'm just taking sodium chloride, which is the hydration thing and the treatment of monoclonal antibody. And the first one, I'm taking the second line treatment first. I don't think it really matters. So, um, but it was more expensive. And I argued with the doc five times and she said, no, no, this is the one. So I did it. And you know, we, the citizens paid for it, I can assure you, because I'm on Medicare. Uh, anyway, so so um, it worked over a long period of time. I had tumors all over the place by the time I started. That's why I started. They were in my, in my abdomen, in my neck. You know, it wasn't great. And they went away. And that was great. And they came back, started coming back, oh, I don't know, five months later. And then she tells me, well, remission, very difficult with follicular lymphoma. You probably won't even go into remission. But there's also a survival thing of about 20 years. And so I assume immediately I'm a survivor because that's another thing that I do mentally. I say to people, look, there's a 10% survival. Why wouldn't you put yourself in that percentage? I, 100%. What's the point of anything else? I mean, you know, I say to people, people call me, you know, I'm dying of cancer. I go, wait, you're living with cancer. There's so much time to be dead. There's eons. So while you're alive, you focus on life. And it's little things. You know, I allow the little things to give me joy every day. Now I'm dealing with two cancers, but really, do I care? No, I care about joy. I care about looking out my window and seeing the birds at the lake. It's, it's incredible. I I did, I did love hearing a child laugh. Who wouldn't? You know, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of little joys in the world that everyone should find. And I, I really recommend that. Better not to focus on anything bad like that. You know, one of the things I talk to women about is everything you need to know for life after or with cancer. Breast cancer is my specialty, ovarian cancer, but this is very important. And yes, you want to be a survivor, but I think that phrase survivor tends to bring the disease with it. And I encourage people to look at cancer as a chronic disease. That's something that we need to go through all the different steps to learn how to manage it for yourself on an individual basis. And not only have you done that, Anne, but you've also bringing that perspective and that critical information to hundreds of women and men when they attend your wonderful conference, which is coming up February 23rd to the 25th. I encourage everyone to go to AnnieAppleseedProject.org. And at the top, there is a little button about the upcoming conference. Considering the wealth of information that Anne is presenting and with the expert speakers, it is extremely priced reasonably. I mean, it is, it could be thousands of dollars. It's not. And it's, this is something that I really want to encourage everyone to give themselves selves for the new year to get started on the right path of a different perspective about cancer. And, uh, and the more outside of the box you can put yourself from medical oncology and standard American diet and American perspective on advertising, which is so toxic, the healthier you will be. The uh, conference is not only people with breast cancer. It's any kind of, of cancer. Of course not, right. Any stage and caregivers come, medical people come, health professionals come. And we actually offer up to 13 hours of CNEs or CEUs, so nursing credit or continuing education for a lot of careers. And uh, in fact, we're working right now with the Florida a Acupuncture Association. Great. And um, they're, you know, they're putting the information out in their newsletter and so on. And lots of groups do that because every group, every advocacy group, no matter what their stance is, their, their clients, their, their constituents are asking, 
What is complementary medicine? What is What are lifestyle changes? What's a holistic approach? What can we do? So we're saying everybody at our conference has these questions and the answers. They mingle, they network. And you know, everybody eats together, a lot of back and forth conversation. People right. find what they need. It's really a loving atmosphere. It's so Very. pleasurable. And I mean, I, you know, my husband is saying, Are you sure you want to do it? And I said, yeah, I positively definitely want to have the conference because it's it's an uplift for everybody. And we all need that. It is. We need that. It is. And, it is. and people can see on the website, the speakers, their talk title, you can see about them because each speaker's picture you can click on and you can find who they are, see their website and all that. And next year they have Dr. Carol come back and Thank speak you. to us in 2024 because you have, I mean, I, I'm so appreciative of the fact that you have multiple approach because you're not just an acupuncturist, just a homeopath. I mean, I love it. You know, I think that's great. The more knowledge that you can offer, the better, because there's many paths to wellness, many. There's I many mean, paths to wellness. Yeah. I mean, I'm allergic. So lots of things that regular people could do, I can't do. I just can't, even though I'm much, much better. So the final thing I want to say, I don't remember how much time we have, but um, in, in 1995, I mentioned I've had a recurrence had another lumpectomy, and then I had another recurrence, had another lumpectomy, and finally I said, all right, what's the point here? You know, so I had a big breast, but still was being whittled away. So I had a mastectomy, and after the mastectomy, wow, then the other side had some sort of symptom. It's called Paget's disease of the nipple. I know what Paget's yeah. disease is. But I read a paper after I had a mastectomy, and the mast I said to my female surgeon, brand new, I said, I want you to slice it and dice it and tell me what's going on in there. And she came back to me and she said, well, first I said, and don't take any lymph nodes no matter what. And I write on the form because they tell me, oh, you signed away. Yeah, but I didn't know what I was doing. So now I knew. So I wrote death to the doctor who touches my lymph nodes. She didn't take any. You, you can know, just write. The, you do not have my permission to remove. Right. I mean, yeah, you don't have to be rude. I was rude. But she didn't take anything from the axle, although I doubted that for years, but she didn't because now I know. Anyway, um, so after that, she says to me, oh, you know, there was no tumor there. So I read a paper by Dr. Maurice Black, who used to be well-known, but has faded into the past. And he wrote a paper saying, if you have a lesser version of cancer, if you had a higher version, I had invasive lobular on the left side, and then you have Paget's disease, and it both shows that you're actually healing yourself. So too late. I already had the mastectomy with no tumor. Now, I wouldn't have done it if I realized that, but, you know, we don't. That's another thing. You think a mammogram is so great? It's not. You think an MRI is so great? They have better and better, but it's always, it's not great. Think an ultrasound is great? Not great. It doesn't give us all the details we need. Sometimes people have to get all of them to give a holistic picture. And even that's not great. But back in the day, forget it. I mean, the only thing that I could have was an MRI. And, um, oh, my first mammogram, hello, big breasts. I come in, the woman says, we need the big tray. And she goes and gets the big tray and then she slams it down on my breast, black and blue, black and blue. She probably caused breast cancer, but anyway, I don't know for sure. But it was horrible, painful, black and blue. Hematoma. That should never, that's, you should never be black and blue after a mammogram, ladies. Yeah. That's totally unnecessary. Yeah. And Stuff happens. Okay. So 1997 rolls around and I have the mastectomy on the left, mastectomy on the right. And the left side, I see tiny little tumors. And I'm going, what could that be? You know, I had a mastectomy. What's going on? So now it turns out you can have tumors on your chest wall yes, because you can. there's breast tissue there because it looks like tissue, but it's breast tissue. Okay. So two doctors tell me, oh, you're stage four. That's stage four because it's on your chest wall. The guy's first one says to me, well, it probably went through your body and now it came out on the chest. So I said, probably? No tests were done. And he says, yeah, it probably did. It probably can't. You know, he thought it was nothing. I thought probably it was weird. The other guy says, well, it may have gone through your body. I said, it may have. That was it. No test, nothing. No bone scan, no anything. Now I decide to go to Mexico. Well, I went to Mexico in 95. And I went again in 97 because going, oh, wow. I, how could I have stage four? I mean, anyway, <laughs> that was 97. So hello, it's 2022. That there's wonderful clinics in Mexico. Dr. Jimenez, who was I is a guest this year, or was a guest when I was in the there. Past. Yeah, in the past, yeah, not yeah, he's wonderful. I refer people there yeah. all the time. Yeah, we've had there's there's a lot of excellent clinics, and they, they do a lot of different, you know, many paths to wellness, and they offer organic food. So I like that, and also they're kind. When I went to the first, when I went to the clinic the first time, get there on a Friday, the head nurse comes to me Friday afternoon. 
And she says to me, I'm sorry, I don't work on the weekend, but I want you to know I love you and I'll be thinking of you. So I explained, right, walking around for two nights in the hospital without a single human contact. And here this woman whom I don't know and who doesn't know me tells me she loves me. That it, was, it was very heartwarming, even though I'm not a mushy person. But that was, she meant it, you know, and I could tell. Love and healing energy are very, very important. Yeah. And knowing that you're seen and heard as an individual, not as a cancer patient, is very critical. And I think Anne's dedication and attitude and approach to everything she has done for herself and now is bringing to the world is just really admirable. And I just want to give you a lot of acknowledgement for that. And thank you for being here. And to everyone who's listening live and watching this later, I want to encourage you all, AnnieAppleseedProject.org. It's one of the best gifts that you can give to yourself for the new year. And thank, thank you me. so much for your story, for your caring, for your work. And I really appreciate you spending time here. And ladies, this is Carol Laurie signing off for now, and there'll be more later. Thank you again, Anne. Thank you. Appreciate it.